So in this video, I'm gonna cover hepatitis. Uh, we're gonna do a little summary of hepatitis. We'll look at all the various infectious hepatitises, hepatitis A, B, and C in particular. There's also a D and an E, uh, but those are less common. And then we'll look at um, autoimmune hepatitis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, alcoholic hepatitis, and then what I mentioned is becoming an epidemic is the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So hepatitis just means inflammation of liver tissue. It results from liver injury, and again, there could be many causes. Um, it's classified as acute if it resolves within six months, and that's typically from infections like hepatitis A, from drug toxin injuries, uh, those are the most common causes. The outcome of acute hepatitis uh, hopefully is resolution. Uh, unfortunately, it can progress to chronic hepatitis, like in hepatitis, some cases of hepatitis B and of course C. Um, and then fulminant hepatitis is another potential outcome, and that is where the inflammation is so bad that it causes massive hepatic cell death, resulting in liver failure. And that we see sometimes with hepatitis B, D, E, drug-induced hepatitis, and autoimmune hepatitis. Um, chronic hepatitis lasts more than six months, and the outcomes are, as we explained before, the laying down of fibrous tissue, collagen, fibrosis leading to cirrhosis, there's an increased risk for hepatocellular carcinoma and liver failure. Um, so that's kind of the progression again for chronic hepatitis. The presentation is going to vary on the type and the cause. Um, it can be a complete lack of symptoms, so very asymptomatic, and a lot of people too, very severe liver failure. Um, but some of the kind of typical presentations for acute hepatitis might be uh, things like a flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, headaches with jaundice, maybe an enlarged liver spleen. And then as we get into the renal failure, I mean the uh, liver failure, then we start to see uh, more of the liver failure symptoms we already reviewed. Um, the causes, the more complete list here would be infectious. Again, the viruses, hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Um, there are parasites, which are not common here in the US that we would typically not see in our patients. But if you work in Africa, work overseas, you might see more of uh, trypanosomes, uh, leishmaniasis, malaria can all induce hepatitis, uh, and then different bacteria like E. coli, Klebsiella. Um, gonna be more typical in um, more immunocompromised patients there. Um, metabolic, hep alcoholic hepatitis, very common um, cause of hepatitis in the U.S. from uh, alcohol abuse, uh, different toxin and drug-induced hepatitis, and then I mentioned the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's autoimmune hepatitis, and then the different genetic causes like alpha-1 antitrypsin, hemochromatosis, Wilson, and there are a number of different glycogen and lysosomal storage diseases I didn't talk about, which also end in, uh, can result in hepatitis. And then there can be congenital, uh, for example, lack of the formation of the biliary ducts can result in hepatitis. Ischemic, and that's from a blockage of the arterial blood flow into, or potentially the portal flow, but usually arterial flow into the liver. And then, uh, of course, idiopathic. Uh, so with hepatitis, we always want to kind of try to figure out what the actual triggering agent is. And that would be through our history physical exam. Uh, looking at the different liver function tests with elevated liver enzymes, potentially viral markers. So when I see elevated liver enzymes in patients, one of the next steps I always do as a primary care physician is to do viral function testing for uh, hepatitis B and C to see if that, that's uh, a, a potential cause. Looking to see if there's any anemia, any or extra iron accumulation in the body in the case of the hemochromatosis, looking at your complete metabolic panel, uh, for any signs of renal injury, but also electrolytes, blood sugar, coagulation tests, and so forth. So depending on the case, we might order more. And then imaging, ultrasound, CT, MRI would be our ideas there. And then sometimes we need a liver biopsy as well to help. And the treatment will really depend on the underlying cause. We'll go through uh, some of the basic causes and what their basic treatments are. So with hepatitis viruses, um, I mentioned A, B, C, D, E are all potential viruses, and we abbreviate them HAV, HBV, HCV, HDV, and HEV. Now, hepatitis D is unique in that you need to be infected with HBV, uh, hepatitis B, uh, for this to be pathogenic. So hepatitis D is only superimposed on a hepatitis B co-infection. Um, each virus is unique. 
Um, and that's why, unfortunately, immunity to one virus won't protect you from all the other viruses. So each one has its own unique immune responses. Now, hepatitis viruses are interesting. They're viruses that are specific to liver cells. So unlike a flu virus or um, you know, cold viruses or whatnot, adeno, rhinoviruses, those affect the respiratory mucosa. In the case of a hepatitis virus, it directly affects the liver. And that's viruses have this very unique targeting ability for certain cells, and that's because every cell and every tissue in your body has different um, pattern recognition molecules on the surface. And so the hepatitis uh, viruses are able to zone in on that. Um, the liver can also be infected with other viruses, like herpes viruses, like Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, and uh, herpes simplex 1, but we don't consider those hepatitis viruses. Now the presentation is going to vary with all of these. Um, they can be very mild without jaundice, um, and that is um, uh, very common. Um, you can also have, um, uh, you know, with jaundice and so forth, we see that often in H uh, hepatitis A. Um, severe could be full-blown jaundice, liver disease, cirrhosis, possible liver failure, death, or even liver cancer over time. So it's really going to vary on the type of virus, uh, the person's immune response, and how long they've had the infection. Hepatitis A, let's talk about that. This is infectious hepatitis. It's um, a um, uh, picornavirus. It's, uh, I'm not going to go into the different virus types at this point, but it has uh, viruses are basically either DNA, in this case there's RNA, um, which is then surrounded by a protein coat. That's all a virus is. And um, it's non-enveloped, meaning it doesn't have, some viruses have a lipid layer on the outside. This one doesn't. Um, so all viruses are, and that's why they're not even alive. They're just information, basically, RNA with protein. Um, there's only one serotype, but there's a lot of different genotypes. Um, the virus infects the hepatocytes in the Kupfer cells and multiplies there. Um, UV light and chlorine are, uh, are very effective at inactivating the virus. And um, the hepatitis A virus is actually detected in patients in the stools up to two weeks before any clinical illness develops. The transmission is fecal oral. So we'll see that's not true for many of the other hepatitis viruses. You gotta actually get uh, fecal matter on the hands or in the food and eat it. And so it has to go fecal oral. Uh, very short incubation period, usually a couple of weeks. Um, and we see the sporadic outbreaks in different areas. It could also be epidemic uh, to different areas. Um, this is a direct cytopathic virus. It multiplies again in the Cooper cells and hepatocytes and destroys them. Now, the good thing about this is there's no carrier state. So we'll see with like hepatitis B, you can become infected the immune system takes care of the active infection, but then you become a carrier and you spread it. And that's not the case of Hep A. You can, once your immune system clears it, you actually have immunity to it. The signs and symptoms are variable, but typically fatigue, fever, jaundice, pruritus, abdominal pain, appetite loss, nausea, steadily. And people can be really sick. Um, they can look really jaundiced. They're vomiting. They just have no, they can't get out of bed. Um, but generally, we, uh, this one is good because the um, severe complications and death are very rare. The mortality rate is less than 0.5% overall. Uh, back in 1991, the CDC pointed the death rate of 4 per 1,000 cases, uh, and usually in patients that were older with other medical conditions. I think the statistics are probably a little, little bit better now. Um, 90 percent of infected children actually have no signs or symptoms uh, the once the infection clears as i mentioned there's lifelong immunity uh, but about 10 to 15 percent percent can experience a relapse uh, in six months after the illness clears uh, this does not go on to cause chronic hepatitis so the acute uh, uh, liver response is able to clear the virus and there's rarely any acute liver failure um, there's a couple of blood tests we do for hepatitis A, just so that you know. We test different antibodies. So the IgM antibodies, remember from immunology, pop up very quickly after initial exposure, and then over time they're replaced by IgG antibodies. So we do the IgM anti-HIV antibody, which is present in a couple of weeks after infection, and that persists up to 14 weeks. And then IgG indicate 
tests, uh, anti-HIV indicates that the acute stage has passed or that you are, and or that you're uh, immune to any further infection. Um, and then we check our liver enzymes, especially ALT, that could be significantly elevated. So you see in the picture over here, the IgM peaks, you know, we're looking at about a month here and then it goes down. And then IgG after the month starts to just uh, go up and that means you have immunity. And we can see HAV in the feces here at the beginning. Viremia is we can actually detect viral particles in the blood. And so we see that up to about six weeks. Um, so after about six weeks, most people have basically recovered if they develop symptoms from this. Um, this one does have a vaccine available. Uh, there's two types, uh, inactivated and the live attenuated, and that protects against HAV um, in, um, uh, uh, should be 90% of cases uh, for more than 25 years. And the injection, the initial dose gives a protection after two to four weeks. So if you're going to go traveling, um, you need to get these well in ahead of time to have proper protection. Second dose usually is given um, uh, six to 12 months after that first dose, and that gives protection for 20 years. Um, there's no specific treatment. It's supportive, basically. Again, herbal therapies and whatnot. I won't go into that here. This would be a classic liver damp heat pattern. There's different types of artemisias that are used in Chinese medicine, for example, uh, to treat this. Um, but rest, avoiding fatty foods and alcohol, basically giving your liver a rest, and then giving a balanced diet, staying hydrated, plenty of electrolytes, that sort of thing. So that would be hepatitis A or infectious hepatitis. Hepatitis B virus, or serum hepatitis, uh, it's in a different uh, sort of family of viruses. There are four serotypes and eight known genotypes, so there's a lot of diversity there. And the classic virus has, uh, it's, this is a DNA virus, um, so there's a DNA core uh, of the virus, and then there's a protein uh, capsule around that, and then there's a lipid capsule, and that is studded with different antigens. So there is the M antigen, the S antigen, L antigen, and so forth. Um, and so as we'll see, the immune system makes different antibodies against all these different antigens. Um, let's see, the lipid and the proteins together uh, is what we define as the hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, so all of these together we define as the hepatitis B surface antigen, HBSAG. And the core proteins would be the hepatitis C core antigen. And that's going to be important because that'll tell us, again, through our different uh, immune testing, what stage an illness is, if a person is still chronically infected, and so forth. Um, now, again, hepatitis D virus needs the uh, surface antigen of hepatitis A to become virulent, to actually uh, cause an effect on the body. Um, the core antigen um, is uh, hepatitis A is DNA plus the DNA polymerase. It acts like reverse transcriptase. Again, I won't go into that, but that allows the virus to integrate basically its DNA into your cells and hijacks those hepatocytes and causes them to make more copies of the virus. The body, the, the transmission here is not fecal oral, it's blood or body fluid transmission. Um, so this one we're a lot more worried about, especially in the healthcare setting with like needle stick injuries. It can be transmitted through sexual transmission, semen, vaginal fluids, as long if there's a, a opening in the mucosa, any direct blood contact can cause that. Uh, transfusions, dialysis, tattooing, travel all increase the risk. Uh, pregnancy, there is a up to 90% risk of passing the infection to the offspring. So if a mother is infected with hep C, hep B, it's not spread by kissing, hugging, coughing, sneezing, breastfeeding. Again, if there are open lesions and wounds, there's going to be a higher risk, but that's going to be pretty low. Um, it's 50 to 100 times more infections than HIV. So a lot of people are worried about HIV in the clinic. Actually, hep B is the one, as well as hep C, the ones you need to be worried about. Um, their relatively long incubation period, 50 to up to 180 days, so up to six months. Um, and a third of the world's population has actually been infected and about 350 million are chronic carriers. So that's a problem with hep B. You can clear the initial infection, but you become a chronic carrier and you can spread it. Uh, the virus replicates in the liver, but then it spreads into the blood. 
So acutely, the signs and symptoms might look like hepatitis A, uh, but some have a much more serious disease. Uh, a few can develop actually fulminant liver failure, and that can be fatal. Uh, some have no symptoms, so again, it's very variable. Um, the acute disease usually clears in weeks to months, and 95% of those that are infected clear it, they develop full immunity, and they don't become carriers, etc. It's the 5% that can go on to uh, develop a chronic infection. Uh, that can be asymptomatic, um, but over time that can actually lead to chronic hepatitis and cirrhosis, as well as increased risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and uh, these patients will still have this infection if they their blood is exposed to someone else that can potentially uh, increase transmission as well. So they're still infective. Um, the virus replicates in the hepatocytes. The host immunity clears the viruses and a lot of the symptoms we get of liver injury is not from the virus, it's actually from your immune system targeting it, destroying it. And we'll see that's definitely the case in hepatitis C. And especially if you haven't cleared the infection, the chronic immune response um, is going to lead to laying down of scar tissue and that's what's going to progress into the uh, cirrhosis and liver damage. Um, it's the uh, CD8 cells that we think cause most of the damage and all the cytokines, uh, the Th1 type cytokines that they uh, release. So that's the pathogenesis testing. We have more tests available than the hepatitis uh, A virus. So I'll just jump down here. The anti-HB surface antigen IgG will tell you you have immunity. So if you have that in the blood, you're immune. Um, if you have um, the uh, HB surface antigen, it's the first detectable antigen in the blood. It's not always present. Um, it usually clears as the infection decreases. And uh, so person, you can actually measure the surface antigen to tell you the viremia or the viral load. Um, usually if this surface antigen, can, this is not the antibody again, this is the actual surface antigen. If it's positive for more than six months after the initial infection, we uh, suspect this person now has become a chronic hepatitis B carrier. Um, there are anti-HB core antigens, IgM, IgG, um, and this indicates um, a active infection and that you're clearing the infection. And then HBE uh, antigen IgM indicates an active liver disease. Again, the surface antigen IgG indicates immunity. And then we look at our liver enzymes as well. So we're going to do usually a liver function test together with the viral panels to see where a person's at in their healing process here. Um, so you can see the different titers as they rise here. But the, um, the uh, anti-HB uh, surface antigen IgG, that's going to hopefully rise and continue, and that, that indicates that you have immunity at that point. Um, there are vaccines available. There's several, and they're made from that surface antigen. Um, and so we recommend that healthcare workers or anyone that's going to be highly exposed get those. Again, it's a series of two, sometimes three, usually two um, uh, injections. Um, but um, the uh, babies now, newborns, neonates, are actually immunized for it at birth, um, hepatitis B. Uh, most adults, again, clear the virus and don't need treatment. But if you are one of those 5% uh, that actually have not cleared it, become chronic carriers, uh, there are antiviral medications. I don't know what the latest statistics are on their efficacy, uh, but that's what's usually indicated there. And that's typically managed by a hepatologist or a specialist who who's, uh, has more training and is up to date on the current literature on this. And then we come to hepatitis C virus. This is uh, used to be called non-A, non-B before we uh, knew that it was an actual hepatitis virus. Um, and now we know uh, about hepatitis C. So it's just hepatitis C, HCV. Um, this is in yet a different family of viruses. It is an RNA virus. Um, it is enveloped, so it has a lipid envelope around the protein core, and there are seven major genotypes. Uh, in the U.S., most cases are genotype 1, and then about 20%, so 70% genotype 1, about 20% genotype 2. Um, the transmission here is, again, blood-to-blood -blood contact, so just like the hepatitis B. Um, so blood contaminated instruments, uh, blood products, contaminated needles that, you know, you get a needle stick injury. Um, it was not screened for in the blood supply in the U.S. until 1992. 
Um, and so the majority of patients who have hemophilia, who need blood transfusions that were born before that time, are all now infected with hepatitis C as a result. Um, that's of course screened for now. Um, intravenous drug users are at very high risk of hepatitis C. Uh, with needle stick injuries, there's about a, just under a 2% chance of con contracting the disease from an infected person. So not high, but definitely when we get needle stick injuries from a you know, syringe needle or even acupuncture needle, this needs to be reported and uh, we need to have, you know, have proper follow-up there. Um, tattooing, piercing increase the risk. Sexual transmission, we're not sure. We don't think there's a dramatic uptick of risk, kind of um, like we see a little bit more with hepatitis B, but I put a question mark there. Again, not transmitted through kissing, hugging, sharing, eating, uh, or cooking utensils. And in pregnancy, there's less than 10% chance of an infected mother passing the virus uh, to the baby. Relatively short incubation period, just over a month, month and a half. Um, and we see fluctuating liver chemistry and uh, we suspect about up to 200 million, it's probably more at this point, worldwide are infected. The problem with hep C is it's often asymptomatic. The acute infection people, maybe uh, it happens only in about 15% of people, they think they might have the flu, get some uh, joint pains, nausea, vomiting, jaundice is very rare, and uh, it just resolves uh, in those patients. Um, unfortunately, in about 50 up to 80% of patients that are infected with hep C, they develop a chronic infection. This is a real problem, you know, so again, it's asymptomatic, you don't even know you had it. In fact, I have a colleague who works a lot with hep C and a lot of his patients are actually paramedics and rescue workers who, you know, before we were really vigilant about hep C, HAV, hep, hep B, um, they were, you know, not wearing gloves or they had blood, um, you know, they were covered in blood from different injuries from people. And um, they all, you know, on routine, um, blood testing, whatnot, their liver enzymes are found to be elevated and many of them are infected with hepatitis C. Uh, and um, unfortunately, what happens then is that this can go on and progress to liver cirrhosis, liver failure, and in some cases, liver cancer. Um, so by definition, the uh, having the H uh, hepatitis C RNA for more than six months is a chronic infection. And about 10 to 30% of those patients develop cirrhosis over 30 years. That's a high number. Um, and about 1 to 3% of those will, with cirrhosis, develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so the um, HCV causes 27% of cirrhosis cases and 25% of all hepatocellular carcinoma cases worldwide. So huge player there. And I mentioned that infectious hepatitis, especially C, is a major cause of cirrhosis earlier. There is unfortunately no vaccine. However, there um, is some news in the pipeline that perhaps in 2020, 2021, uh, we might see the first vaccines actually on the market. It's a challenging one though, because there are all these different genotypes. And so the vaccine would have to cover all the different genotypes. Um, we confirm HCV, so we, the screening test we do to check, and in fact, we recommend that anybody, uh, you know, that, uh, that's really over the age of 45, 50 really be screened for hepatitis C, um, and, or younger if there's more risk factors. Uh, we do an anti-HCV antibody immunoassay, and it takes about six to eight weeks after exposure for that assay to become positive. So if you just get an immediate needle stick, you can't just go down to the lab and see if I got it because uh, that's going to take your immune system a while to build up the antibodies there. Uh, once we get positive results on that, we confirm it with a viral load test. That's the HCV RNA, polymerase chain reaction test. Um, and um, if both the anti-HCV antibody and the HCV RNA are positive, then we have an active infection. Um, if we have an anti-HCV antibody, but no HCV RNA, then there's no current infection. You probably have immunity to it, which uh, you're lucky. Um, liver enzymes rise around seven weeks post-infection. And unfortunately, they're poorly correlated with disease progression. They're usually just an indicator of your immune response. And you know that's gonna vary over time. So um, that's not uh, a great marker for active, you know, assessing the amount of liver injury. So what we're doing now is either liver biopsies or what's called the fibro test or fibro shore test. 
and patients to assess the level of, especially in more chronic hep C, if they've had it for many years, and especially if they're becoming symptomatic, um, to do this to assess liver fibrosis. So that's going to be an important part of the workup as well. And then ultrasound can assess fibrosis to a degree as well as uh, presence of any hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so that's the um, kind of workup for uh, hepatitis C. Here's a little uh, graph in terms of initial infection. We get a spike of your ALT, and then it's going to kind of go on. And then your total uh, anti-HCV antibody kind of is progressing. But not shown here would be the um, HCV RNA, and if that's still elevated, then you still have active infection. Um, the treatment, uh, rarely the infection clears spontaneously. Again, that can be between 15 and 45 percent, so I'm not sure if I'd say that's rare. Um, with new meds, um, the treatment is up to a 95 percent cure rate. Uh, the meds are expensive, though. Uh, many of them, like the Harvoni, this is a three-month trial, three-month treatment. I think the costs are around $80,000 for that regimen. Uh, fortunately, more and more insurance is covering it. Um, you have to avoid any alcohol or meds that are toxic to the liver. So this is difficult in homeless populations and uh, patients who have drug addiction or alcohol problems to do proper treatment. Um, and patients with hep C should be vaccinated for uh, hep A and hep B. So the antiviral medications, uh, not all are treated, even with active HCV, we're often uh, assessing the amount of fibrotic damage, the viral loads, uh, et cetera. Um, and then there's sort of equations to kind of tell if a person really is, uh, this, if the therapy is really needed. Uh, but there's various regimens. Uh, so, so Bosfavir, which is Harvoni, this is combination of different medications, usually taken for three months. And again, well over 95% cure rate, especially for the genotype one. Different genotypes are gonna respond differently. And so I didn't list all the different regimens out here. Uh, this is changing actually by the year. And so this is why any of these patients who I suspect you know, need these therapies, I refer to a liver specialist uh, that, that can uh, get the right medication to them. Uh, we used to give a lot of interferon and ribaviron uh, for these. And these have a lot of side effects. Basically, interferon is what you create, your immune system synthesizes to, to when you have the flu, uh, and so you feel like you have the flu every day. And, um, and there's only a 50 to 70% cure rate depending on those. So before these drugs came around, we really uh, didn't have great cure rates with hepatitis C, but now that's changing. We'll see in 10, 20 years if this actually pans out, if we start to see other issues in those patients. And that's kind of unfortunately how it happens is the sort of the drug is on the market. And then we do post-market surveillance to see uh, what happens long-term. The prognosis is gonna vary by the HCV genotype. Um, and that's gonna be measured by what's called sustained viral response. Um, and uh, if we get a sustained viral response um, against the virus, it's going to decrease the risk of liver cancer by up to 75%. Um, so we really, uh, anyone between, I said, you know, 40 and 50, the U.S., uh, uh, the Public Health Service in 2019 recommends anyone between 18 and 79 actually be screened for hepatitis C. So that's hepatitis C. So here's just a summary of the three major hepatitis viruses, A, B, C. Remember, D requires hepatitis B as a co-infection. Uh, that's going to be more typical. We don't see a lot of hepatitis D infection in the U.S. That's going to be more in Africa and other places. Uh, same with hepatitis E. That one also is fecal oral, so it presents somewhat like hepatitis A. Um, but hepatitis A, again, fecal oral, um, most common hepatitis infection in the world um, and uh, it's uh, very little transmission between mother and child. Um, incubation period is about three to six weeks, very short viremia. Um, jaundice again is going to vary. Uh, I have here near 100% but it could be pretty mild jaundice in some cases. No carrier state, no chronic hepatitis, no increased risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. We use our anti-HAV, IgM and IgG. Uh, antibody tests to tell us about active or uh, life or immunity for that. Now, again, these antibodies will be elevated if you've had the immunization as well, the uh, IgG antibodies, and that would tell you you have immunity. 
Hepatitis B, um, this is in 2001, so these statistics are a little old, 8,000 cases per, per year in the US. Um, transmission route has to be parental, so blood contact or body fluid uh, or close contact. Um, yes, there's transmission between mother and child about two to six, two weeks to six months in terms of incubation. Long period of viremia, weeks to years. Um, uncommon with jaundice, but maybe up to 50%. Uh, yes, there can be a carrier state in uh, you know the 15% or, or so or less. Uh, yes, for chronic hepatitis in the 5 to 10%. Uh, yes, increase for hepatocellular carcinoma, and then here's our basic testing, as I mentioned there. Um, going back, there's vaccines available for hep A and hep B. For hep C, um, this again is uh, outdated, but uh, there used to be in 20, 2001, 28,000 cases a, a year in the U.S. Uh, again, fecal, uh, not fecal oral, but blood contact, uh, parental. Um, less than 10% mother to child transmission. Again, two weeks to six months incubation, long viremia, rare jaundice, uh, yes, common carrier state, uh, yes, with chronic hepatitis, yes, with liver cancer. And um, the um, anti-HCV is our antibody. Now, just having that doesn't mean you have immunity like the other antibodies here. And we, again, always check the viral load to see what's happening there as well. And as of uh, 2019, early 2020, we do not have a um, immunization available. Uh, and I won't talk uh, as much about hep D and E because they're not as common here. So these would be the uh, viral hepatitis. This would be one major cause of hepatitis. So that covers the infectious hepatitis. I wanted to mention a few other causes of, of, of hepatitis, both acute and chronic. Uh, one would be autoimmune hepatitis, and that's where the immune system attacks the hepatocytes. Uh, it affects about one to two persons per 100,000 a year, uh, mostly in females. Um, and uh, this is sort of the pattern we see with a lot of autoimmune disease, more common in females. Um, and we see usually more acute hepatitis that can progress over time chronically to cirrhosis. Um, and we might see things like amenorrhea, elevated estrogens, things like that as presenting complaints. Um, we do our classic serology tests. I won't go through that again and confirm with liver biopsy. And the treatment here, um, remission occurs in up to 80% of cases. So using our level one, level two therapies might really help to reduce the immune response. So we know reducing stressors, anti-inflammatory diet, uh, working with um, a lot of the herbal patterns and whatnot could be very helpful. Um, unfortunately, this can frequently relapse. And so typically immunosuppressive agents, glucocorticoids, azathioprine, which is immunosuppressant, methotrexate, cyclosporin, tacrolimus. And I've had a few where it's been very difficult and over time their liver just progressed into liver failure um, and they uh, might need a liver transplant in those cases. Um, so that's autoimmune hepatitis. The, I haven't seen a lot of patients with this. The majority I've seen have been fairly stable over the years, but we do see chronically uh, you know, progressing loss of liver function, unfortunately. Um, so that's autoimmune hepatitis. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, remember alpha-1 antitrypsin is a glycoprotein produced by the liver. It's an inhibitor of proteases, especially elastase, which is secreted by neutrophils, one of your immune cells in the lungs, especially when there's any lung injury, like in cigarette smoking, uh, air pollution, inhalation, or whatnot. Um, having alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency puts a person at much higher risk, even if they've never smoked, of developing emphysema. So we see in emphysema patients, there's a subgroup um, that have never smoked and uh, they develop actually emphysema at an early age and they often have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Well, unfortunately in the liver, um, you can have problems as well. So we get excess, excess amounts of an abnormal form of that protein accumulating in the liver and that starts causing uh, hepatitis, liver inflammation. And uh, so in addition to emphysema, now we progress into liver cirrhosis as well. So alpha-1 antitrypsin, just want to kind of point out, not common, but um, can have profound effects on the liver, on the lungs. Also, there's effects on the skin, in the kidneys, and vascular. Um, so it has a lot of devastating effects around the body. So that's one to be familiar with. Um, 
in, in terms of the presentation. The last two causes of hepatitis here I'm going to talk about is alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So let's look at the alcoholic liver disease first. Um, alcoholism is the leading cause of liver disease in industrialized countries. So over 20 million Americans uh, abuse alcohol. Again, these are statistics from a few years ago, so they might actually be more now. 25% um, of all hospitalized patients actually have some alcohol-related problem. Um, that said, it's amazing that only 15 to 20% of alcoholics actually develop cirrhosis. So uh, I've seen patients that have uh, major drinking issues and we do testing and their liver is, uh, there's no sign whatsoever of any inflammation, uh, the transaminases aren't elevated, um, et cetera. Um, we've even gone further and done ultrasounds on some of them, no issues on that. So um, it's again, a testament to the regenerative capacity of the liver. Uh, by definition, the consumption of 60 to 80 grams a day, that's 75 to 100 milliliters a day of alcohol uh, for um, 20 years in men, or 20 grams a day, 25 milliliters a day uh, in women uh, for 20 years, increases the risk of hepatitis and fibrosis anywhere between 7 and 47%. So it kind of gives you a little bit of estimate there on the uh, amount of alcohol you have to consume over a long period of time to even see some degree of uh, hepatitis or fibrosis. The classic changes we see in uh, alcoholic liver disease are steatosis, the fatty changes first, so the hepatocytes accumulate fat. This is um, reversible and this often even shows up after a weekend of binge drinking. Um, and uh, so that, but that fortunately can change very quickly with alcohol cessation, good diet, some exercise, etc. Um, alcohol is metabolized in the body, so ethanol uh, is the alcohol we consume, different than methanol, which of course is not good. Uh, but alcohol is metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase, ADH, in the liver, and it's metabolized into acetaldehyde. Um, and uh, there's several different pathways that can lead from ethanol to um, acetaldehyde, even your gut microbiome helps you a little bit there, uh, but uh, I've kind of listed out some of the more common ones here. Um, and then acetaldehyde is converted by um, aldehyde dehydrogenase into acetate, acetic acid, vinegar basically, uh, which then dissociates into carbon dioxide in water. So the problems really come from the acetaldehyde um, they can accumulate. In fact, the hangover sensation a lot of people have and dehydration from the hangover comes from excess acetaldehyde. Now, part of the process of alcohol processing also creates a lot of reactant, reactive oxygen species. And um, this is what can further damage the DNA and the liver cells where this is happening. So that's uh, another, that's one of the major drivers of this. Um, this process also generates NADH, uh, which is an energy carrier. So we get a lot of NADH charged up. This is reduced NAD. And that's going to induce fatty acid synthesis and more triglycerides that are going to accumulate in the liver. And that's what leads to the steatosis. Uh, further damage, we see abnormal proteins accumulate in the hepatocytes. That's called, that's called Mallory's hyaline. And then dying hepatocytes, these are called councilman bodies, can be seen on uh, biopsy. Um, and then uh, alcoholics can often stabilize and stay in the state of steatosis for years um, without any evidence of hepatitis. But then in some, uh, we start seeing inflammation, hepatocyte, increased hepatocyte necrosis, early fibrosis. Uh, about 10 to 35% of heavy drinkers develop hepatitis over time. Um, again, amazing it's not 100%. Um, the alcohol de detoxification, as I just said, really creates a lot of reactive oxygen species. We also get leaky gut with gut endotoxins coming in and the Kupfer cells become activated. All of this results in a localized immune response with increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that, uh, over time, is going to cause fibroblasts in the liver to start laying down collagen, most likely as a protective mechanism. And that's what creates the scarring that'll lead to cirrhosis and specifically the portal fibrosis around the portal veins. Uh, even quitting drinking uh, completely at this stage may not be enough to reverse the changes. Um, about 20% of those who quit drinking at the acute hepatitis stage will develop cirrhosis. 
and now we get the chronic inflammation and um, this uh, we get activation of the stellate cells as well those are like fibroblasts as i mentioned in the liver they also remember are called ido cells they store vitamin a but they become activated and they start laying down collagen and that is when we get cirrhosis so we go through our classic kind of pattern that i already discussed with chronic liver injury with healthy liver progressing to steatosis progressing to um, uh, fibrosis and then into cirrhosis and some even to hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and of course that can lead into liver failure and we'd see the acute complications there. So that is uh, alcoholic hepatitis, again, a leading cause of liver disease in industrialized countries around the world. I think uh, some countries like Russia has a very high rate of this, US a little bit less, but we definitely see a fair share of these patients over time. Now, more ominous is the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, and that's uh, excessive fat buildup in the liver due to causes other than alcohol use. And uh, it's the most common liver disorder in developed countries, again. Um, so we're actually seeing it surpass the numbers on the alcoholic uh, liver injury. Uh, we think there's between 75 and 100 million Americans in 2017. That's up to 25% of all the U.S. population have some degree of NAFLD. Um, I think the numbers are actually a little higher in different populations. Pediatric populations, it goes up over 30% and so forth. Um, up to 80% of these patients are obese. Um, but it's important to remember that about 20% of normal weight people, people have a normal BMI, um, we call that a lean NAFLD. I've seen a number of those patients um, develop it as well. Um, we think up to a quarter of the people worldwide are affected by it, and it's twice as common in males than in females. The, one of the original physicians who did research on this back in the 1960s, it took him two years to recruit 10 patients with NAFLD um, to find 10 patients. And now you can pretty much find those in a couple of hours of, of searching. So um, it's really uh, increased in, uh, in epidemic proportions, basically. Um, so there's two types. Both have more than 5% liver steatosis. There's the non-alcoholic fatty liver. Um, and that is a stage which usually doesn't progress to any further liver damage or NASH. So not all those 25% will progress on to the next stage, which is NASH non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and that includes both fatty liver and liver inflammation and that can eventually result in fibrosis and that might lead to our classic cirrhosis liver cancer liver failure as well as an uptick of cardiovascular disease as well and so we're worried about you know the steatosis progressing into NASH that's going to be the more serious form here um, typically, except for uh, the lean patients, typically we see insulin resistance. Now you can get insulin resistance in lean patients, um, but there's often other inflammatory factors that drive it in those patients. Uh, but usually, especially with a higher BMI, we see insulin resistance with metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome, again, is having obesity. Um, you can look up the definitions in terms of um, BMI, but also waist circumference. That's another big measure that we use. Uh, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. Or can also just be pre-diabetes, not necessarily actually uh, diabetes yet. So having type 2 diabetes and obesity, um, diets very high in fructose. We know fructose actually tends to the way the liver metabolizes it. Uh, especially in high levels, tends to increase the production of liver fat. Um, having too much of the omega-6 fatty acids with a deficiency of the omega-3s and decreased choline, all of these have been suggested as dietary risk factors. Uh, older age, uh, sleep apnea, genetics, dysbiosis, and so forth. Um, choline is important because this is actually one of the nutrients we need to help clear the liver of extra fat. In fact, we call this a lipotropic factor. Uh, so lipotropic factors um, really help clear and detox the liver and a lot of supplements over the counter will contain choline, methionine, and inositol. Those are other lipotropic factors uh, for that reason. Um, most patients with NAFLD are asymptomatic uh, and they might have uh, normal laboratory profiles until they get into NASH and that's where we're going to see the elevated liver enzymes. Um, but patients might just have general complaints of fatigue, malaise, if they have insulin resistance and prediabetes, they're going to have all those kind of symptoms. 
but typical liver, jaundice, all that's going to be pretty rare for NAFLD. Um, in uh, the pathophysiology can be this, again, the steatosis alone, steatosis with lobar or portal inflammation without ballooning. These are all uh, things that can be seen on histology and biopsy, and then steatosis with ballooning without inflammation. Um, so a change from simple steatosis to the inflammation in NASH uh, involves what we call a second hit phenomenon. So maybe increased oxidative stress, hormone imbalances like low thyroid, low melatonin, high stress hormones and insulin, mitochondrial dysfunction, and again, nutrient deficiencies have all been postulated as why we go from NAFLD into NASH. Uh, what, what is that next trigger? The gold standard is liver biopsy, although we typically don't just do it routinely. Typically, we order a liver ultrasound and maybe a liver MRI, but usually ultrasound can detect uh, fatty changes. If we suspect cirrhosis, then we're going to go deeper and, of course, do biopsies. Our labs, liver function tests, are usually not sensitive enough to detect it, so they're usually normal. We do rule out viral hepatitis and autoimmune disease in these patients. Uh, we might do the liver fibrosis blood tests in later stages, thyroid function tests, coagulation tests, and then our standard labs to look for blood sugar, uh, insulin resistance, all that. Uh, the treatment here would be by using the therapeutic order. Um, so we'd kind of use our labs biopsy if we did that to kind of guide our, our treatment results here. Um, there's different guidelines available, American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, etc. I listed them out here. You can find those guidelines online. Um, but the kind of emphasis is on low carb and low fat diet, so maybe increasing lean proteins, um, and then more of a Mediterranean diet kind of approach. Lots of vegetables, good nuts and seeds, olive oil, that sort of thing. Um, calorie restriction, another very important tool here, and then avoiding any alcohol. This is not caused by alcohol, but certainly alcohol can worsen that. Um, exercise is probably the most effective treatment. Um, that's gonna improve insulin resistance, and that's a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic. And we typically say if we're going to do non-rigorous exercise at least 30 minutes, five days a week, that's like walking, stuff like that. But if you're doing more vigorous exercise where you're kind of at the point where it's a little hard to speak, um, that is usually 20 minutes at least three times a week would be kind of the minimal levels uh, to suggest for exercise and then stress reduction. Here's a number of nutrients that have been looked at for um, the uh, NAFLD. Vitamin E in particular, um, vitamin E really is one of eight. Uh, so what most people call vitamin E is called D-alpha tocopherol. That's what's in most supplements. That is in, that's one of eight different vitamin E's. In fact, there's four what are called tocopherols, four tocotrienols. You need all eight of them to be healthy. Unfortunately, most supplements contain the one, D-alpha. And in fact, they contain a synthetic version of it. It's called D-L-alpha. Um, but, but basically, um, you need all eight. And unfortunately, if you take too much of the D-alpha tocopherol in a supplemental form, you're going to miss out on absorption of all the other seven. And that could be a real issue. So we usually, if we're going to do vitamin E, I recommend vitamin E rich foods, avocado, nuts and seeds, that sort of thing. Um, and maybe doing a full spectrum vitamin E complex that has all four tocopherols, all four tocotrienols. Um, so that would be that. Vitamin D has been looked at here as well. Uh, B vitamins, I mentioned choline and inositol, lipotropic factors. Um, looking at chromium, which improves insulin sensitivity, selenium for antioxidant support, little tiny bits of copper, also to help with uh, the mitochondrial function. Omega-3 oils, like in the flax, but also cold water fish. Um, the mitochondrial nutrients to support mitochondrial energy. So there's a bunch of them on the market like CoQ10 and whatnot. These are all speculative, but they may have, uh, uh, you know, help patients with the NAFL to improve their mitochondrial function. Probiotics, again, question mark if those are helpful. And then um, some of the classic liver herbs, milk thistle, turmeric, green tea. I won't go into that here, but we would of course do a pattern differentiation and treatment from the perspective of Chinese medicine. Usually any sort of hormone imbalances could be corrected just by correcting the patterns, but if you need thyroid replacement, that would be important. There are currently no approved medications, but um, anti-glycemic, hyperglycemic drugs are used, and a big one here would be metformin. Uh, we'll talk about pioglitazone in the diabetes section. 
It is uh, an insulin sensitizer, but there are some cardiovascular concerns about it, and it's not commonly prescribed anymore, but it might have a role in NAFL. But you might see patients on metformin, which is a very common diabetes, type 2 diabetes drug um, for NAFL. But no data that I've seen that actually improves NAFLD. It's just something that people are doing. And then statins for cholesterol are often given if a person has elevated cholesterol and triglycerides. So that's kind of an overview of the approach to NAFLD. Again, we've seen an uptick in these numbers and the numbers are going to continue to increase. And we're probably going to see more cases progress into NASH and then unfortunately into liver cirrhosis, liver failure, and liver cancer. Um, so that's a summary of the major forms of hepatitis. We'll talk about just a couple of other liver disorders and then gallbladder disorders in the final video.